Welcome everyone to New Life in the Bronx Church. We are so glad that you can be with us here another Sunday morning. I like to wish all the men a very, very happy Father's Day on this Father's Day. May the Lord bless you and make his face shine upon you. May the Lord bless you in your relationships with your family. Hallelujah. Praise God. Uh, we hope that you will enjoy yourself today. We pray that the Lord would meet you right where you are. And before we go, we like to wish our very own Sister Josie a very, very happy birthday, as this week will be her birthday. It is also another special birthday. It's the birthday of Sister Kim Cuesta. Kim, may the Lord continue to heal you and bring you back to us. We look forward to your return. And so, Without any further ado, let us worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Praise God. Enjoy. Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to come before the Lord our God in prayer. Father in heaven, hallelujah. Thank you that we can call you Father. Almighty God, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for another day. We especially thank you today, Lord, for our men, for fathers, for men who are not fathers, at least not biological ones, but Lord, we thank you for all the men in our congregation, all the men in our world. Lord, you made them so specially, and we want to say thank you for that. You are the father to the fatherless. And, that, and that's very important for us to know today because we recognize, Father, that everyone may not have a good feeling about a father, but we thank you that you're the perfect father. We thank you that you're the father that goes after the lost one. You go after the one, that man who may be brokenhearted, that man who may be discouraged today, that person who just needs to know that there's a father that loves them. And that's you, our heavenly father. You are just, you're mighty, you're amazing in everything that you do, and yet you're merciful, and you also are the father of compassion. You understand what it feels like to be a man and to be a man that needs a father. Hallelujah. And so today, the word for us today on this Father's Day, as we're going through everything that we're going through, as, as people are out marching and protesting, the word is instruction. Father, we've, we've been out there and we've been protesting. We've been making our voices known. We've been praying. And now we want to know what to do next. Father, show us what to do next. Your word says that whether we turn to the right or to the left, we'll hear a voice behind us saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. Lord, you tell us in your word that we can rejoice because the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord, and, and we need our steps to be ordered today, every single one of us, as we're going through this time. Lord, we thank you that you said that the, the road that, that leads to salvation is narrow and wide is the road that leads to hell. So we're asking you to help us stay on that narrow road. And thank you that you've given us some wonderful instructions in your word to help us stay on that narrow road. You told us to trust in you with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength, and not to lean on our own understanding, but in all our ways. If we acknowledge you, you'll make our path straight. God, you are so wonderful. You make it so simple for us to come back into relationship with you. You, you tell us that if we acknowledge you, you'll make our, our path straight. You say that if we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. You're amazing. God, you are so amazing. And that's important for people to know, for men to know today that you have a heavenly father that cares about you. And today, if you have been far away from Father God, 
today is the day you can draw near. Even if you need to just lift your hands right now and say, Father, I recommit my life to you because I know without you I'm not going to make it. Do that right now. He's just a prayer away. Hallelujah. He never leaves us and he never forsakes us. Now, Father, we thank you that you say, who then is the man who fears the Lord? He will instruct him or you will instruct him and show him the way. So we thank you, Lord, that at this time, we're not going to fear any man. We're not going to fear any guns. We are only going to have reverent fear for you. You know why? Because you promised us that you would instruct us and teach us in the way that we should go. Today, Lord, we're thankful that your word tells us that we're blessed. Blessed is a man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, who does not stand in the way of sinners, and who does not sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the Lord. And on his word, he meditates day and night. That's right. You want to know how there's going to be a change in your life, my brothers and sisters? Meditate on the word day and night. You know why? You, when you meditate on God's word, you'll be like a tree planted by the river that brings forth fruit in its season. And this is the best part. God, you say that whatever they do will prosper. Father, you are a mighty God, and we want to praise you again and again and again. We just can't stop thanking you enough. So keep us, almighty God, today and tomorrow. <laughs> keep us every moment of the, of the day. We are looking to you, almighty God, to be our strength and our provider. And for this, we give you praise now and always. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise Hallelujah. the Lord. Yep. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're going to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice because the Lord's love never fails. That's the reason to rejoice. Hallelujah. We're going to rejoice in the Lord today. Yes. Here we go. Our strength is renewed in your presence. As we wait on you, our joy is restored in your presence as we worship you. Our faith cannot be shaken, nothing can separate us. The Lord is with us, the Lord is with us, our God is for us, he will never fail, the Lord is with us. The Lord is with us, our God is for us, he will never fail, never fail, never, 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 never fail, never fail, our hope, hallelujah, our hope is revived in your presence as we sing to you. Your word comes alive in your presence as we trust in you. Our faith cannot be shaken. Nothing can separate us. The Lord is with us. The Lord is with us. Our God is for us. He will never fail. The Lord is with us. The Lord is with us. Our God is for us. He will never fail, never, 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 never fail, never fail, never fail, never fail, never fail. Here we go. He's defeated all of our enemies. He has put all things underneath our feet. He has conquered them and given us victory. The Lord is with us. The Lord is with us. 
our God is for us. He will never fail. The Lord is with us. The Lord is with us. Our God is for us. He will never fail. Our hope is revived in your presence as we sing to your you. Your word comes alive. Your word comes alive in your presence as we trust in you. One more time. Yes, you're with us, Lord. You're with us, Lord. He will never fail. Never, never, never. Never, 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 I'm gonna see a victory 
for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. Oh, I'm not backing down from any giants, for I know how this story ends. Yes, I know how this story ends. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to the Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Hey. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Yes, I know that you, you take you what the enemy meant for what evil, the enemy meant for and evil. You turn it for and you turn it, turn it, turn it, turn it. You turn it for good. I say that you, you take what oh, the enemy meant for you evil, take it, take it, and take you turn it, it for good. Turn it for good. You turn, turn it for good. I'm so glad you turned it for good. And you, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you. Every 
you made a way for all to enter in. You make us brave, Lord. You make me brave. You make me brave. You call me out beyond the shore into the way. Praise the Lord. Once again, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you to our praise team for bringing us that music that ushers in the Holy Spirit. And once again, I'd like to say to the men, happy Father's Day to you. May you have a blessed day in Jesus' name. You know, recently, Reverend Robert Sheck, a former evangelical activist with the white, what is called the White Evangelical Church, spoke about a Faustian deal that the church made with President Donald Trump. In this deal, President Trump agreed to give the evangelical church everything they wanted on their laundry list of political deliverables. If they agreed to give him religious cover. Now what does religious cover mean? That means that the leaders of the white evangelical church, our brothers in Christ, whether we agree with them or not, they are our brothers in Christ, agreed to say that Donald Trump, President Trump, was blessed of God and that everything he has done is good. To me, this clearly explains uh, why there are religious leaders allowing President Trump to make comments such as he has done more for Christian, the Christian church than Jesus without any pushback. This bowing down to the desires of President Trump and allowing consistently, uh, consistent, supremely offensive behavior is not only affecting the moral character of our nation throughout the world, but it is also negatively impacting the spreading of the gospel, especially among the young. In this interview that I, I was watching on CNN, uh, in this interview, it was stated that the surrendering of our prophetic voice 
the voice that Christ won for the believer has resulted in many people turning away from the church, if not the faith. It was reported that the membership of the Southern Baptist Convention, the, la- the nation's largest denomination, has continued to show a loss of membership. It was reported that its membership has declined for 13 straight years, with this year showing the largest decline in more than a century as people under 45 years of age are turning or or, or rather, are turned off by the hypocrisy of the church. You know, I believe Reverend Sheck was correct, stating that the evangelical church must become Christ-centered. And that's not just for the evangelical church, that's for all churches. All churches must go back and check to make sure that they are Christ-centered, where the emphasis is on listening and following Jesus above anyone or anything else. Does that sound familiar? Don't bow down. Amen. Whether we agree with what is called today, what today is called the white evangelical church or not, we must acknowledge that as Christians, both individually and as a church, we are impacted by this behavior because what they call the white evangelical church is what is splashed all over the TV. If there is a news report, particularly around political areas, it's going to be the voice of the white evangelical church. Is there any wonder that our children and younger members of our family and communities do not want anything to do with the church. Now, there are some believers. Some believers may say that it's okay as long as they accept Jesus Christ. However, I would say to to those who believe that, that we need to remember that the church is the body of Christ, and that we are instructed not to forsake the assembling of the saints. You know, if there's anything that I've learned during this time of COVID-19 and social unrest is this. We need our young people. So I want to say to the young people today, I want to speak to you, if I may, for a second. We need you. We need you in the church. We need those young people who are believers in Jesus Christ. You, we need your voice. We need you to speak. We need you to teach and help us to recognize and understand what is going on today and to help us face our faults as older Christians, to face our faults and ask the Lord for forgiveness so that we can change. The Bible says it's iron sharpen iron. So one believer sharpens another. And it doesn't say how old or how young you are. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you see me going wrong, you need to sharpen me. Amen. I need you to sharpen me. So young people, we need you. We need you to complete the call that God has placed on the church. Therefore, And our call as a church, our call to stand and to not bow down to anyone or anything, we need to do as the saying goes. We need to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. So today, I want to speak from Matthew chapter 23, the first through twelfth verse where Jesus instructs the crowd and his disciples to not do as the Pharisees and the scribes do, because they do not practice what they preach. You know, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many sociologists, the church has lost its position as a place in the community where people go for instruction and guidance. 
And if we, the church, are going to regain our position in the community and our voice in the community and this nation, we are going to have to do what Barry White, the singer Barry White sang in one of his hits, the late Barry White sang, you have to practice what you preach. I know that's an older reference, and we want you young people, but I had to use that one because it's so apropos. You got to practice what you preach. I believe the Lord is saying to us today, and I want to talk to you about the need to practice what you preach. Although people may have become leery about the church, they still want Jesus. So if we practice what we preach, then the, the, the people who want Jesus but don't want the church will see the body of Christ. They will see Jesus in our behavior, in everything that we do, in our talk, in our thoughts, and in our, be, in our actions. If we practice what we preach, they will see the body of Christ in action. Because how many of you know faith is an action word? James says, faith without works is a dead faith. And Christ is not dead. Christ is not in the grave. So we are the body of Christ, empowered by his Holy Spirit. Then guess what, folks? We are going to live in action the words that we find in God's word. So let's read Matthew chapter 23, starting with verse 1 and going to verse 12. Father God, once again, I ask you to be with us as we cover your word. Speak to us and guide us in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Hallelujah. Starting with verse 1, the Bible reads, then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries. I knew I was going to have trouble with that word, but that's okay. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbis by others. But, Jesus says to his disciples in the crowds, you are not to, to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Praise the Lord for the reading of his word. Amen. You see, in today's scripture, we find Jesus warning the crowds and his disciples against what? The hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the other religious leaders. Jesus instructs the crowds and his disciples to carefully do everything they tell you noting that they are sitting in Moses' seat. Now remember, in, in, in addition to delivering God's message to the Israelites, 
Moses served as the leader, uh, Moses as the leader uh, that would use the law to judge when there were disagreements amongst the people. So although the Pharisees were not speaking for God, they knew and understood the law, and they would uh, act as judges when there were discrepancies in the camp. So Jesus says, when they sit in the seat of Moses, be careful to do what they tell you. Amen? It's like when the church, when the Christian church back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s sat as the place in the community where people went to get guidance, to deal with disagreements, the people were called to listen. But if we don't allow God to put us as the church back in our, in, in, in our right place in the community, and people won't come. It's the sad truth. People just will not come. So he said, remember that they were sitting in Moses' seat. Hallelujah. However, they were not to follow the behavior of the Pharisees because the Pharisees did not practice what they preached. I would submit to you today that that is the problem with the Christian church. That we are not practicing. Sadly to say that we as a body in, this, in, in the United States are not practicing what we preach. If we were practicing what we preach, I'm, I'm going to jump to Malachi real quick. I'm, I'm going to get back to the other thing, but let me go down to Malachi. Malachi, in Malachi chapter, now I got to find it. Just give me, give me a chance. I know it was Malachi 6. Uh, yeah, Malachi, I mean Micah, not Malachi. Micah, chapter 6, verse 8. I want, I want to read that to find out what the, to, to, identify what the Lord requires us as believers to do. So Micah chapter 6, verse 8. And today I'm going to read from the modern King James Virgin, Version. He, that being God, has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does Jehovah require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Amen. You see, this is what God is requiring us to do so that he might place us back in our right position in the community where we have not just a voice, but we have a voice of power. Not to get things done the way we want to do, but to get things done the way God wants them to be done. Let me tell you, there's a difference between doing what we want and what we see is right and what God wants and what God says it's right. You see, when we go after what we want and when we start talking about what we think is right, we lack kindness. That's what would make the Southern Baptist Church, the largest denomination, turn over their God-given power to get political favors from a presidential candidate. We lack the love and the kindness. We fail to walk humbly with our God. We want to lord power and authority over others. And that is not what God has called us to do. When God places us in a position of, of authority in our community, it's so that we would speak love and kindness and that we would what? Do justice. Jehovah requires of you what? 
but to do justice, to treat people justly, to show mercy, and to walk humbly, which means that we are, as Jesus said in, in uh, Matthew 23, that we are to be servants of all. I pray you're getting this understanding. We are called to be servants of all. Not to be Lord. We have a Lord. Not to be rabbi. We have a rabbi. Not to be father. We have a heavenly father. No one needs those things. What our communities need and new life in the Bronx, what our community right here needs are servants of God who walk humbly with God. Amen? I'm going, to, I'm going to move it from the national scene, and I'm going to get it into the Bronx right here, right here in the Pelham district of the Bronx, the Pelham Bay section of the Bronx. We're going to get right there because that's where we live. That's where the people in our community reside. Amen? So God tells us to that the greatest among you will be servants for those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves and walk humbly with God will be exalted. So Jesus tells us that we're not to follow the behavior of the Pharisees because they did not practice what they preach. Firstly, they would burden people with their laws and rules. However, they would not do anything. They would not even lift a finger to help. God has saved us. God has blessed us so that we would be a blessing to others. God has called us not to burden people with the law, but God has uh, instructed us to proclaim his gospel of grace. God has called us to get up and go and serve others in love, to lift a finger to help somebody to become free instead of weighing them down with heavy burdens. It's amazing how we can hold others to standards that we're not willing to do ourselves. We have to be careful, my brothers and sisters. We have to be careful not to, to uh, criticize others, not to judge others, especially when we won't do it ourselves. We have to practice what we preach. You know, Christ came to set us free, not to tie us up. Secondly, they were focused on looking right on the outside instead of looking to the one who is righteous. You see, there, there's much that goes wrong when we look, when we try to look right. That's what all those laws are. You can't go to the movies. You can't do this. Oh, your, your, your outfit has to be a certain way, a certain look. All those things are burdens. Let people come as they may, and we will minister the gospel of love humbly in the name of our Father, Jesus Christ. We will walk humbly with God, and we will speak in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and we will allow God, we will allow God to work in the lives of others. Amen? God is not calling, it's, called, it's, it's instructing us, rather. The Lord Jesus is instructing us not to live, not to follow the example of the Pharisees and the religious leaders because they kept people out of the kingdom of heaven where God has called us and saved us so that we would be a living witness and that we would be living testimonies to the power, the salvation power that comes through our Lord Jesus Christ. So they focused on looking right instead of looking to the one who is righteous. They, they dressed to distinguish themselves as, as being better than others. Now we know that, that God says, wear the scripture on your head and on your arms. That's what that word that I have trouble pronouncing 
And it's really about. Theirs was wider than everybody else. They made their tassels longer than everyone else. For the, simply for the purpose of distinguishing, them, distinguishing themselves above other people. Do you know God has not called us to be above? He has called us to be the head. He has called us to, that means he has called us to be in front, to lead, but not lord. There's a difference between leading and lording. When you lead, you do it first so that others would follow. When you lord, you start giving instructions and telling others what they should do even though you're not willing to lift a finger. And I tell you today, God has called us to lead, not Lord. So they dressed to distinguish themselves. They sought glory. And they sought honor that belonged to God for themselves. They wanted to go to the, sit in the best seats. They wanted to be acknowledged in the street as rabbi, as teacher, as leader, positions that were to be held by God and God alone. Finally, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were using their titles to claim the authority that belonged to God. You know, it's almost like at this point, at this point, it seemed like Christ drew the line. He said, that's enough. That's enough. Christ instructed the people to not, uh, and he instructed the disciples to not be called by any of these names, to not use any of these titles, because only God deserved those titles. There's only one God, and the rest of us, as the scripture says, you're not to be called rabbi, the rest of you are brothers and sisters in Christ. That means that we are equal. Now, you know, if you came from a family like mine, I came from a family of seven boys. And there was an age difference. And every one who was older thought they were in charge of everyone else who was younger. That's how it goes. But that's not what brotherhood is about. And now that we're older and we've grown into men by, by the grace of God, we, we, we work more together. When no one is lording any authority over another, we are brothers. We are unified as brothers. No one is no one has the right to lord authority over another. This is what Christ is telling his disciples, and this is what Christ is telling us today, that we are not to be lords, we are to be leaders. Amen? I hope that makes some sense to you. Jesus warns his disciples and the crowd against these hypocrisies. Just as he is warning us today, because he understands that God cannot honor such hypocrisy. There, is, there should be no surprise why the Christian church is losing members. If we want to see people come to Jesus Christ, then we are going to have to practice what we preach. If you tell someone, don't do that, you should not be doing it because you're preaching it, so therefore you must do it. Now watch that. Watch this. If all of us practiced what we preached, I'll tell you, our preaching would change significantly. You want to talk about adding grace? You want to talk about adding grace to your preaching? You want to talk about adding grace to your uh, uh explanation of who Jesus Christ is, I tell you today that when you will add grace if you have to live up to every word that came out of your mouth. 
You would have to change. You would have to change the way you spoke. You would have to change the way you preach. Probably many of you who say, oh, I want to get up there and preach like Pastor Val, you would say, no, that's okay. And not that I live a perfect life, but I extend grace because I have to practice exactly what I preach. So Jesus warns us because he understands that God can, cannot honor such behavior. Jesus knows that if we live such hypocritical lives that the church cannot continue to thrive and receive the blessings of God. We, cannot, we will no longer receive those blessings that God has bestowed upon the church. We are blessed, and I want you to keep hearing this and, and keep practicing it, keep preaching it, that we are blessed. We are blessed of God so that we can be a blessing to others. When you read your scriptures, I want you, and you read about Jesus Christ, I want you to be very, very observant of the actions that he took. Like the woman who, who was caught in adultery. And everybody, all the religious leaders were around pointing fingers. She is an adulterer. She deserves to be stoned. What do you say, Jesus? And Jesus, looking down to the ground, says, let any one of you who has not sinned practice what you preach. Any of you who has not sinned, let that person throw the first stone. And quickly, Jesus heard stones hitting the floor and saw people walking away. And then when Jesus looked up from the ground, he saw just him and the woman. And he says, there's nobody here to accuse you? And he says, neither do I. Amen. Imagine if we lived like that. Imagine if we lived like that. Imagine if we took the stones in our hands and, and remembered Jesus' words that, that anyone who has not sinned, throw the first stone. We would throw that stone down so quickly. Come on, tell the truth, shame the devil. We'd throw that stone down and we'd ask Jesus for forgiveness. We'd have to ask Jesus to have mercy on us. And Jesus would say, just as I extend mercy, I want you to extend mercy. You, church, Christian church, you are my body. You are the very representation of me. The Holy Spirit of God that God blew into me is now living in you. I need, I want, I demand you practice what you preach. Amen? You practice what you preach. And when we practice what we preach, we will see the hand of God move and transform lives. Praise God. Praise God. I thank God that God doesn't just leave us out there. I thank God that Jesus points his disciples in the right direction, starting in verse 11, uh, that the, when he says that the greatest will serve others. Amen? The greatest among you will be a servant. And in verse 12, he teaches us that those who exalt themselves, those who elevate themselves, will be humbled by God. And that's what we see happening to the Christian church today, unfortunately. Unfortunately, we are being humbled by God. But those who humble themselves and recognize who we truly are, servants of God, saved, sanctified to serve others, both those who believe and those who have yet to believe. That we treat everyone just as they are God's wonderful creation. Amen. That those of us from African American descent would remember we deserve to be treated as a person, that we would treat others 
who come into this country, new immigrants who come into this country, we would treat them as a person because they are a person. They are created by God. That we who humble ourselves and walk humbly with God would be elevated by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, this speaks to our relationship with everyone we come in contact with, regardless of what their position is in life or what they have to offer. The church is not a door for people who have money. Our bills are paid by God. As God blesses his people, his people take care of the bills for the church. Jesus reminds us that God's ways are so different from our human understanding. We are called to serve God in faith. Because, as James says, faith without works is a dead faith. So returning to Micah, chapter 6, verse 8, where God says, God has shown you Oh man, what is good? And what does Jehovah require of you but to do justice? Do justice. Treat every single person we come across justly. And to love kindness. To be kind. Even, and it doesn't say when they are kind to you, that we are to love kindness so that we are to treat others kindly. Whether they treat us kindly or not is not the issue. Our job as servants of God, as people who are glad to be servants of God, are called to serve. And what greater time than now to serve others and to walk humbly, which means the authority is God, to walk humbly with God, acknowledging that God is the way, the truth, and the life. So as we prepare to go back out into the community, uh, as God requires us to do, we are called to practice what we preach. And if we practice what we preach, those in the community will hear Jesus' voice, and know that God is with them in Jesus' name. Amen, that God is with them. They will know that God is there. They will see the love of Christ as we humble ourselves before God and serve him and him alone, as we walk in faith and not by sight and we stop ridiculing other people, but begin to love and raise them up with our words and our actions, we will see the hand of God come down and touch and change those we enter into relationships with. Amen? God is the way. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ, so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have the wonderful gift of eternal life. I want us to practice what we preach. We ask others to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Then we have to treat Jesus Christ as he is what he is, our Lord and Savior. If we say, accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then he must be our Lord and Savior. I want to say to you today, by the grace of God, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, and I am a servant. Just like Alfred the butler. When Jesus calls, I say, you rang. Just like all butlers today. You know, they don't even show butlers anymore. In today's, you you ever notice that in today's movies and TVs, they very rarely show a butler. 
But Alfred and Batman was a butler. Uh, my young people know that. A butler is one who serves. Who serves. We are called to be God's butlers and maids to serve. And so, if we serve, I am happy to serve Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. He has saved me by his grace. And so I want to take a moment right now to practice what I preach. And I want to extend to you an invitation. An invitation to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He is a loving, a loving Savior, a loving Lord, a loving Master. He has died so that we may have the gift of salvation, that we may have the gift of eternal life by his grace, not based on what we have done, but based on his grace. I want to extend this invitation to you today. If you want to become a soldier in the army of God, if you want to become a servant of the powerful Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, then I want to invite you to repeat this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I come to you. I come to you today just as I am. And I believe in faith that you died to forgive me of my sin and to raise me up to serve you. And so in the name of Jesus, I accept you, Lord. I accept you, Jesus Christ, as my Lord and Savior. And I acknowledge that my sins are forgiven and I am a new creature ready to serve you and you alone. I thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross and I thank you for coming into my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You know, if you said that prayer, you now have been added to the followers of Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you to find a church. It doesn't have to be this one. But find a church that preaches God's word. That preaches God's word and, and find members of Christ's body who will encourage you. Who will serve you and will teach you how to grow in this wonderful relationship with Jesus Christ. So before I go, I want to say once again, can't say it enough. Happy Father's Day to my Father who art in heaven. Happy Father's Day to my brothers. Go out and practice what you preach so that our families may build up and grow strong in the grace and love of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you, and God keep you. We love you. Amen. May my life be a reflection of your power and your glory, breathing in the breath of heaven, leaning in to hear your heartbeat. And my heart, my thoughts, my mind, Lord, they are yours now and Come and do with me your will and I'll be yours today.